This is the last in a series of three uh, short talks on quantitative genetics. Uh, we're continuing with our discussion of how we can use quantitative genetics to understand something about evolution of quantitative traits. All right, so when we left off last time, we had this equation uh, for population variation. We had the variance uh, due uh, in the phenotype, and we broke that down into a genetic uh, and an environmental component, and then a genetic by environmental interaction term. What we want to find out here is what the genetic component is, because the genetic variance is the part of the variation that is what we call heritable. That is the part that can be inherited from one generation to the next. And what we're going to do is use that information about heritability to say something about uh, what proportion of the phenotype is heritable. And we have two different types of heritability that we're going to calculate. The first type is something we call broad sense heritability. And here's how it's defined. Uh, it's capital H squared, and it's simply the genetic variance divided by the phenotypic variance. And this is almost always going to be less than one, unless all of the variation in the population is simply due to the genes and there's no environmental effect whatsoever, uh, this ratio will always be less than one. So it just tells us what the proportion of the, uh, the phenotypic variation is that is controlled by genes in some fashion or another. That's the broad sense heritability. There's another kind of heritability that actually turns out to be more important uh, for quantitative genetics when we're trying to understand evolution. And this is called narrow sense heritability. Narrow sense heritability is symbolized with a lowercase h squared, and it's v sub a, and this is what is called the additive genetic variance. I'll explain that in just a minute a little bit more clearly. But it's the additive genetic variance, and again, we divide that by the phenotypic variance. And once again, the additive genetic variance is almost always going to be less than the phenotypic variance, so the narrow sense heritability is going to almost always be less than one. And it's telling us the proportion of the phenotypic variance that's made up of additive genetic variance. Now, now what is this additive genetic variance? Let me see if I can make some sense of this for you. Let's look at a really simple case here. Um, this is clearly not a quantitative trait. It's going to be a Mendelian trait, but it's simpler than a quantitative trait, and therefore, I hope, will make it easier for us to understand uh, what is going on. So let's assume that the big A allele is dominant, and then let's ask how reliably can we inherit a particular phenotype depending on what our original genotype was. So we want to know how reliably a particular phenotype is inherited given a particular uh, genotype. Now note that when the homozygous dominant mates with anything else, it's guaranteed that it will end up having offspring that have its phenotype because its offspring will always get at least one copy of the dominant allele. So in that case, the heritability is 100%. All of its offspring are going to end up being just like it is. But if we pick any other genotype, whether or not its uh, offspring will inherit its phenotype are going to depend on what it mates with. So let's look at an example of this. If we take a heterozygote, big A, little a, and mate it with a homozygous recessive, only half of its offspring will have its phenotype. So the reliability with which its offspring can inherit its, uh, its phenotype when it mates with a homozygous recessive is only 50-50. It's not 100%. And so this causes a problem because the genetic variance, V sub G, doesn't distinguish between what can be reliably inherited and what is simply due to particular genes. It's clear that the phenotype that uh, the heterozygote has is due to its genes, but its offspring may not end up with its phenotype. And so that's why we have the genetic variance that we call additive genetic variance. That's the proportion or part of the uh, variation, the genetic variance, 
that can be inherited reliably from one generation to the next. Now, this is, uh, and this is what I just said here at the top of this slide. The important thing, though, is that I don't want you to worry how to calculate VA. That tends to be kind of complicated. The additive genetic variance is not a trivial thing to calculate, and you need to know some statistics to do it. What's critical for you is to understand conceptually why we end up using the additive genetic variance when we're studying uh, quantitative trait evolution rather than the uh, genetic variance, V sub G. Because what we want to know is what can be reliably inherited. It's what's reliably inherited that actually is going to evolve. And so we're going to use additive genetic variance, and that is we'll tend to use the narrow sense heritability rather than the broad sense heritability. Okay, so how can we actually get these values? Well, let's talk about two different ways we can do it. One is by using what are called selection and response curves for directional selection, and this only works for directional selection. Or we can use parent offspring regression, and that will work for any kind of selection. All right, so let's jump in and look at this situation here where we're going to use these uh, for directional selection. What we're looking at here is an initial population with a mean value in it of t bar, and that's represented here. Now what's going to happen is there's going to be selection, and all of these individuals here uh, that have red lines going through them are going to die. So only these individuals here are going to reproduce. Um, these individuals that are going to reproduce have a new mean, population mean, which is t bar sub s. Okay, so the, it's the new average trait value after all of these guys die off. We're still in the same generation. Nobody's reproduced yet. It's just that the population mean has changed because all of these guys with the smaller version of the trait have died. And we can get from this something called a selection differential. This is a capital S, not a small s. And the selection differential is just the difference between the uh, mean of the population after selection uh, and the mean of the population before selection. That's our selection differential. Okay. Now, these guys here that survive, they undergo mating to produce a new population. Okay, so this is the next generation with a new distribution. And that new distribution is going to have a new mean that we'll call T bar asterisk or star. Okay. And what we can get from this is the response to selection. And the response to selection is the difference between the mean value in the next generation, t bar star, and the original value in the population before selection in the previous generation, so minus t bar here. That's our response to selection. Now why are these important? Again, I'm not going to show you all the math here, so you just have to take this on faith, unfortunately. But it turns out that there is the following relationship, that the response to selection is equal to the narrow sense heritability times the selection differential. And we can rearrange this equation where if we know what the response to selection is and the selection differential, we can take this ratio between these two things and that will give us the additive genetic variance. Okay, well, not the, not the additive genetic variance. I'm sorry, I should restate that. It will give us the narrow sense heritability. What's the value of knowing this? Well, if we know the narrow sense heritability, if we know what the selection differential is in the population, we can then predict what the response is going to be. Okay, so that's really valuable. All right, let's take a look at this next slide. This is just another uh, example of, uh, a couple of examples of how this can work. And part of it is to point out that heritability is not the same thing as whether or not something actually has a genetic component to it. You can have zero heritability of something that's completely genetically controlled. Uh, for example, if you look around the room uh, during class, everybody probably has five fingers per hand. The fact that they have five fingers per hand is definitely genetically controlled. 
but there's zero variation in that because everybody has five fingers. There's absolutely no variation in the number of fingers, which means that the heritability is going to be zero in that population. So you can have a population that has zero heritability for a trait, but that doesn't mean that the trait is not something that is inherited. Okay? So let's look at this, an example here. For example, what we've got here uh, in this column is a situation where the heritability is zero. We have a selection differential that gets applied. Only these individuals survive over here, and they have a new population mean. But after they reproduce, they just produce the exact same distribution that was there beforehand with the same mean. And so in that case, even though we uh, performed selection on this, there was no response to selection, and so the heritability of the trait is zero. On the other hand, here's a case where the heritability is one, well, not quite one, but close to it, because what we see here is that the selection differential and the response to selection are equal to each other. So after we do the selection, and have this set of individuals to reproduce, they end up producing a population that has the same mean as they had after selection. So in that case, the heritability is perfect. It's one. Okay. Now let's think about the second way we can do things, parent-offspring regression. We've already seen this before. We know that Geospiza fortis has undergone various selection regimens here when they have dry years. And what we do to figure out the strength of, uh, of the response to selection here is a little bit different. What we do is we look at the, the value of the trait for the parents. So we have to go into the population and mark all the individuals and know who the parents are of certain offspring. And then what we do is we measure the trait in the offspring and we compare the size of the trait in the parent and the size of the trait in the offspring. And then we fit a line to that and we get a slope. And that's going to look like the following. So here's a place where we have done two parent-offspring regressions. The red one is from 1976, so the parents uh, and their offspring from 1976, and then the parents and their offspring from 1978. And it turns out that if you calculate the slope of that line, that will again give you the narrow sense heritability. So for example, we could get the slope on the red line from 1976, and that slope will be 0.76. And that will tell us that the uh, narrow sense heritability of this trait of beak depth is going to be uh, 0.76. That is 76% of the variation in that trait is due to additive genetic variance. Okay, that's the end of this set of slides. Uh, good luck with the assessment.